that you we're so happy that you uh, are able able to take the time at this late hour um, to to join us. Um, I have a very bad cold, and so I just wanted to say hello. But my dear friend Helene Abramson is going to introduce you, and um, and I there's so much going on there that I assume that you have some things that you'd like to tell us, and then there'll be I'm sure many many questions on what you uh, what you discuss. So uh, if there's a, any particular uh, direction you want to take the the discussion in, the floor is yours. So happy you're here. Hello, Rabbi Abadi. Thank you for joining us today. We're very excited. Um, Rabbi Dr. Eli Abadi joined the Jewish Council of the Emirates, um, also called the JCE, in 2020 as its senior and resident rabbi, making his home in Dubai. As the Jewish community in the United Arab Emirates experiences dramatic growth due to an influx of Jewish tourists from Israel and the West in the wake of the historic signing of the Abraham Accords, Rabbi Dr. Abadi provides spiritual leadership to the local community, helping to build and grow Jewish life in the Gulf. Rabbi Dr. Abadi joined the JCE with a vision to create a critical Jewish infrastructure for the local community including a day school, a mikvah, a beit din or Jewish court, and um, creating an Arabian kosher certification agency. He descends from a distinguished rabbinic lineage. He most recently served in several spiritual leadership roles, including as director of the Jacob E. Safra Institute for Sephardic Studies at YU in New York, founder and head at the Sephardic Academy of Manhattan, and rabbi of Manhattan East Synagogue. He also served as co-president of Justice for Jews from Arab countries, JJAC, where he was instrumental in passing a congressional resolution on behalf of Jews from Arab countries so that they are recognized in the negotiations regarding the Middle East refugees. He earned his rabbinic ordination from Yeshiva University, Rabbi Isaac Elkanan, Theological Seminary or Rites, and is also a practicing medical doctor. We are excited to have him here with us today. There's much he has to share with us, but we will try to stay within the format. Please put your questions in the chat box and we'll get to as many as possible. Rabbi Abadi, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you very much. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, AFC uh, is and has been a, 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 an organization very close to my heart since uh, the late and beloved uh, dear friend uh, Helen Friedman, um, who used to run it, and uh, we did a lot of activities together. I hosted AFC many times at the synagogue and later on at my second synagogue. So um, it, it's difficult to, to believe that Helen is no longer with us, but her spirit is definitely here with us, her drive, her convictions, and um, that's what really keeps us and keeps FC going. So um, let this be in her beautiful memory uh, this evening. Having said that, uh, maybe I'll just give you a, a brief uh, introduction to my uh, arrival here in this country and what really brought me here and how are things going uh, in the last six months that I have been here and also maybe a little bit of what happened in the last two weeks given the, um, the, 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 Gaza, uh, the Gaza events. So um, my uh, first contacts with, uh, with the United Arab Emirates came uh, over 10 years ago when a dear friend of mine uh, from New York who uh, has been doing business with this entire region uh, for over 30 years, um, we met and uh, we became very good friends until today. And he, in fact, actually he is uh, one of the main reasons I am here. Uh, but he uh, would introduce me to UAE uh, government officials when they would come to New York. As he knew, I spoke Arabic. I'm from the region, born in Lebanon. 
um, you know, know the Arabic culture, the Arabic cuisine, um, versed in the Quran and Islam. So uh, he found it fascinating that I could speak with the government leaders in Arabic and discuss theology, religion, politics, regional things. And so that, those were my first contacts with, with, with this country in New York, in the United States. But only two and a half years ago, uh, this friend of mine who um, said, you know, I want to invite you to come to the UAE. There is a small Jewish community. It's not an official community yet, but uh, it has the tacit approval of the government. And I would like you to come and see it. And I also would like to bring a Sefer Torah in memory of Sheikh Zayed. Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nahyan, who was the founding father of the United Arab Emirates, passed away uh, seven years ago or so. He says, I want to bring a, a Torah to the community, but in memory of, of Sheikh Zayed. Uh, he said, please bring me a Sefer Torah, especially a Sephardic one, those that stand with beautiful case, as it should fit the, the ambiance of the country. I said, of course, we'll do that. So we made the first trip. I visited the community. I got to know the community. And um, we kept in touch. They kept calling me for advice, for whatever it is. Uh, but nothing, uh, no, no thoughts at all of coming and living here at all. Uh, a year later, when the Sefer Torah was ready, so we came again, we brought it. We were invited to Abu Dhabi uh, to, uh, to, the, to the palace of the crown prince, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed. And we presented the Sefer Torah in memory of his father. We, so we stayed there for a few hours. We discussed, we, uh, we reminisced about our childhood in Lebanon as he used to summer in Lebanon because uh, United Arab Emirates weather in the, in the summer is, is uh, unbearably, uh, uh, unbearably hot, uh, over 110 degrees or so. Uh, and high humidity. Actually, it started this past week was the first week, so to speak, of, uh, of weather like that. So to the crown prince and his family used to um, summer in the mountains of Lebanon. That's where I used to summer myself. And we reminisced about uh, an ice cream parlor or the movie theaters and things like that. Uh, and that was it. That was uh, over a year and a half ago. Uh, after the, and I kept in touch, I kept in touch with the community and with the people here. It's only after the, um, the Abraham Accords, which I knew they were coming. I knew for over two years that uh, they eventually were coming and there's going to be a, a peace treaty normalization with several uh, countries in the, in the Gulf. And I'm, uh, I know many of you probably who are here tonight uh, have had that conversation with me. Uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago, and I have assured you, if you remember, that uh, we will have peace in that region, and Israel will have uh, uh, will have diplomatic relations. We just have to be patient that it will come, and thank God they came. So after the the Abraham Accords, the the the, the government requested from the small Jewish community to incorporate to be an official community. Uh, the community was actually recognized in uh, 2019. Uh, in the year of tolerance that was declared here in the UAE. Um, and a very famous document called Human Fraternity was signed by the Imam of Al-Azhar University and also by Pope uh, Francis um, here in the UAE of the country of tolerance. And they declared 2019 as the year of tolerance. A book of tolerance was published where all the communities of faiths in this country were featured. One of those communities was the Jewish community with the picture of the Sefer Torah with people praying and the, and the small uh, synagogue villa that they had. So the government requested the community uh, to incorporate, to become an official community, uh, to build a synagogue, but they told them that they need a rabbi, Be, you know, a community, a faith community without religious leadership is just not, not a community. And so that was the time in which they approached me and they uh, asked me if I, if I would be the rabbi. I gave it a thought for a few days and I said, I'll take that challenge. Uh, obviously, I think the, the requirement was uh, somebody who uh, has been already rabbi for, for, for a few years at least 
has the experience that spoke the language that knows the region that has uh, connections and and uh, and relations uh, in the Jewish world um, and so that's what brought me here I I saw that as a um, as a challenge as a call if you will that maybe the Almighty uh, is putting me here for uh, to change more this region uh, for the future, um, for a better future in a sense. And um, so I accepted, I accepted that, that responsibility. And I believe we are at the crossroads of, uh, of history uh, in this region. And um, if we are called upon to, to be part of it, I felt, uh, I felt uh, uh, compelled, so to speak, I felt it's an imperative. If, if, if I was chosen, then maybe this is where I should be. And so I came. I came six months ago and I was welcomed uh, with open arms by the government, by the Emirati society, um, by the community. And I have uh, opened uh, so many doors, established so many bridges of, of uh, communication with the, with the Emirati society, with the government uh, and with the, all other communities of faith. Um, I, uh, they look up uh, to me as the representative of the Jewish people. I'm kind of the ambassador of the Jewish people. There is an Israeli ambassador, but that's a political uh, appointee. This is more of a religious representation of, of Judaism. And that's how they see me. I have written many articles in local newspapers in English and in Arabic. I have been interviewed uh, by uh, official uh, uh, news uh, outlets. Um, I was uh, featured uh, as the, the three uh, religious uh, group, three Abrahamic uh, religion, right? Islam, the, greater, the, the greatest uh, imam, the head imam of the UAE, the representative of the Pope, uh, the Cardinal here of the UAE and myself as the Jewish representative. We were invited to participate in what's known as the Majlis of His Highness, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed, which he does every year during Ramadan. And uh, we were invited to participate, to speak, and to also have a dialogue with, uh, with His Highness. Um, and so uh, that, has, that was seen by the entire population. They repeated the pro, they filmed the program, of course, they repeated it many days during Ramadan for 30 days. And so um, I'm considered in a sense that official uh, representative of the Jewish people. They have been very nice, as I said, very cooperative, very helpful. They want the community to build a synagogue. They're gonna be giving us a land. Uh, we are basically waiting for that land in the next uh, few weeks or so, location at least. Um, they want us to be proud of, of who we are and um, they want to welcome us back. To me, uh, on a personal level, it is like closing a circle as uh, I was born in the region, yes, in Lebanon. I was born in an Arab uh, society, uh, the Arab culture. Uh, I heard the uh, Mu'azzin when I was a, a child up to, you know, from age one to age 10 that I lived in Lebanon, I smelled the, uh, the uh, aromas of, of, of the markets. Uh, um, and so coming back is like kind of closing the circle, going back to my uh, childhood. Um, so uh, I felt, and as, as I said, uh, that responsibility to take. So um, in the last two weeks, uh, before uh, actually those two weeks, when I, when I landed here, of course, I was apprehensive a little bit, even though I have been here a few times before. I was apprehensive, um, but I understood that this is a very safe country, very well protected. Security services are second to none. Um, I walk with my kippah on my head the whole time, anytime, anywhere. Uh, in, in, in this country. And uh, I get only either Shalom Aleichem or Salam or smile or welcome. People sometimes wanted to take a picture with me with the kippah. Many of them heard about Jews. They have not seen Jews. Now they have in the last six months, they've seen plenty of us. Uh, and so um, it, it was welcoming. So I asked one of the ministers uh, if I need a uh, protection if I need a, a, a bodyguard, 
to protect me while while I'm on the streets and things like that. So uh, he told me, uh, "Are you afraid of something? That did anybody try to?" to attack you, said something to you, anything like that. I said, no, no, nothing like that, nothing at all. He said, if you want, we could definitely put one for you and it would be our pleasure to do it, but we don't think you need it. Uh, but if you want it, we will put it, you know, with pleasure. And he said, but let, let me assure you, he said, that from the moment you uh, came down uh, from that plane, we have been protecting you. So, uh, Security services are second to none in this country. Crime is extremely, extremely low. Um, white collar and blue collar crime is really very low. And so I feel very secure. And the last uh, uh, 10 days, actually, I, um, I was in Israel exactly uh, when the war started and left exactly when the war ended. In fact, when I arrived that Monday afternoon, an hour after my flight, that's when it all started. I was received with fireworks and, and all kind of, uh, of, uh, of sky, uh, sky explosions, unfortunately. I had to run to the shelter many times. Two of those, uh, 3 a.m. and 1.30 a.m. Um, you know, to, to the shelter. And uh, we returned that Thursday, and that Thursday night, uh, ceasefire, um, you know, came. Um, but I received only text privately, and also on social media from my friends here in the Emirates of support of Israel, of support of the Jewish people, of friendship. Um, did not receive any negative one from anyone that I know. Uh, there were, of course, in social media some uh, negative uh, comments, but they were not really from the Emirates. They may have been from the surrounding countries here. And uh, there have been several articles and, and pronouncements from the government officials in support of Israel against terrorism and against Hamas. Uh, of course, uh, they're very concerned about the humanitarian situation there, as we are all. Um, but uh, all in all, it has been a, um, and it has been a, a very positive experience Unfortunately, even during this time uh, in which the Abraham Accord not only are, are uh, uh, standing and, 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 uh, and nothing has happened, but in fact, today the, there was an announcement of an Emirati student going to study in IDC in Herzliya. This was announced today uh, and it was announced with pride and the government official issued a, a, a congratulatory statements to him and to the, to the bilateral relationship between Israel and the UAE. Um, I guess I could stop here if you want. If you have any questions, any comments, we could, uh, we could go from there. Yes. Um, we have had a, a couple of questions come in and I'm sure they'll bring on more. Um, uh, Joseph Flashner has wanted to ask, what are the chances of an interfaith dialogue between Islam and Judaism? And would you encourage it? Well, I have been already uh, uh, conducting and participating in uh, interfaith dialogue for, uh, I would say for almost two decades. Uh, I have participated internationally and nationally. I've been at the Homme de Parole uh, Congress of Imam and, um, and Rabbis in France. Uh, I have been uh, in the Baku uh, World Religious Leaders Summit. I've been in Sri Lanka um, um, conference of, of also national reconciliation and religious leaders. I have been also in the United States in New York, tri-state area, uh, interfaith dialogue. So, uh, do I encourage interfaith dialogue? The answer is yes. However, what's the purpose? Um, those interfaith dialogues are not uh, theological dialogues. We are not trying to see whose religion is more important, is better, or is, 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 uh, is, uh, is correct. Those dialogues are strictly to get to know each other, to, to uh, be friendly with each other, and to help each other in situation in which uh, there might be some conflict amongst our communities at large. 
uh, and that is the purpose of those of those dialogues. Of course, some of those international dialogues that I participated in the last two decades were a rapprochement in Israel between Jews and, and Arabs or, uh, and Muslims. And again, uh, those were not theological dialogues. They were only dialogues to find com commonalities uh, between the two communities, how we could help each other, how we could know each other. I, I, I do believe that, uh, that uh, you need to know uh, the other person, you need to know their traditions, you need to know their ways, their needs. And by knowing each other, you feel closer to each other. By feeling closer to each other, you embrace each other. And by embracing each other, you maintain peace. So yes, interfaith dialogue is important. Uh, again, you need to know uh, from the beginning, what are you going to accomplish? in that interfaith dialogue. I'm in, in, engaged in that here. Now here, I do have theological discussions uh, only because uh, they want to know more about Judaism. They want to know more about Jews, about the religion, and they're fascinated to see that Islam and Judaism are two very, very close religions. Now, I knew that since a child, but many of them here the imams and, 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 and the average uh, Muslim don't know that. Uh, and the more they see of us, and the more I explain to them, the more fascinated they are by seeing how close it is. And if many of them believe, well, yeah, well, you know, Judaism was there and, and you know, Islam is, 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 a, is, a, is a sister religion, was a daughter religion of Judaism. So uh, yes, I have engaged in theological dialogue, but that's only because they want to know more and they want to learn more. I, I have Emiratis want to learn Torah. They want to learn the, the words of the prophets. They want to learn Hebrew. There's already few ulpans here in, in UAE, uh, Hebrew uh, classes. And they find fascinating also that Hebrew and Arabic, also there are two sister Semitic languages. Yeah. Uh, the letters are pretty much the same. The pronouncing of the letters is pretty much the same. Let me just ma make here a note that Ashkenazi Hebrew is definitely not the same as, as, as Arabic, but Sephardic Hebrew or Mizrahi Hebrew is pretty much the same because the pronunciation of those letters is exactly the same. So they find that very, very fascinating. And so that type of, of, uh, of dialogue I have, uh, I have been involved. I mean, if I give you just some example, uh, the word, the Hajj, you know, the Hajj, the famous pilgrimage to Mecca. Uh, where did that word comes from? Hajj is written het gimal, right? But they pronounce the g as j. And now if you read it in Hebrew it is hag, right? What's a hag for us, hag. right? For us are the three pilgrimage holidays, Passover, Shavuot, right? And Sukkot, they were pilgrimage holidays to Jerusalem. The same, the same concept. Uh, they have the, when they surround the Kaaba all around many times when they go visit. That's very similar to the Hakafot that we do around the Mizbeach in the temple uh, in those days of Sukkot that we do all around during that pilgrimage. They're just so much, so much uh, common, really common. They have, they have, we have kosher food, they have halal. Uh, the animal has to be slaughtered, shechita, like we do. And they have to. They don't eat the, the the blood either. And so they're very very similar things. It's uh, we 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 are two sister religions and we are two sister languages. And I must say we are two brother and sister communities. And so that's what we achieve with with those dialogues. It sounds absolutely wonderful to have this kind of brother sister relationship. Do you focus at all on the narrative of? of the different religions, or at least the Jewish, the, the Israeli narrative, in terms of the Jewish community and the general public about the legal rights of Israel. This is Goldie Steiner's question. Uh, how informed is the Jewish community and the general public about the legal rights of Israel to the land, to, to Israel? Right. Um, and what is the general stance about the goings on in the last Right. So, so there are many uh, Emiratis, uh, even from Saudi Arabia and from other countries in the region, that have made already videos explaining why the Jews uh, are the, uh, the, the righteous inheritors of the land of Israel. Uh, the first 10 
chapters of the Quran establishes very, very clearly the lineage of the Jewish people from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They speak about the, 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 the slavery in Egypt. They speak about the exodus from Egypt. They speak about Moses, Moshe, and they also speak about, uh, you know, arriving to the land that God has given Bani Israel, which is Bene Israel. So there is no question about that. The Quran states it very clearly. Many of the, the uh, Muslim theologians, moderate Muslim theologian, I must say, they, they state it very clearly without, uh, without any reservations. It is only the unfortunate extremists and the unfortunate radicals who uh, want to change that or want to interpret it differently. And, uh, and that's what this country, the UAE stands, stands for moderate Islam for what they believe to be the true Islam uh, where it recognizes uh, the Jewish uh, people, the Jewish religion, and it recognizes that the land of Israel belongs to the Jews. Uh, so that debate exists in social media, and that debate exists also in our society here. Um, we don't engage too much in political uh, discourse because uh, the population here uh, varies from over 192, 93 countries. Uh, and so you have a lot of views, uh, but most of those views are kept private and personal except the view of the government, which is supportive of the state of Israel. Wonderful. Um, are there enough, the Jews that are becoming part of your, your congregation uh, or your council, are they um, generally people who were in hiding and not, not coming out because the religion was not recognized or are they really new people coming from Israel? Or... Well, uh, I, I met the Jew that has been here the longest. He is 42 years old. Yeah. And he was, he's 42 years old and he has, he came here at age of two. His parents brought him. Uh, he's the old, he's not the oldest Jew, is the longest Jew that has been living here. We have Jews that are older than that. Um, so I think Jews have been here 40 years and less. Now there may have been some Jews that came with the British because this used to be a British colony. Um, and they may have come with them in the petrochemical industry or in government, uh, uh, you know, Jews in, in government. But of course they, they did not uh, live here as Jews or as Jewish community. But the Jews that have been here for 40 years, 30 years, some of them lived Judaism privately because it wasn't known. Um, but in the last 13 years, things have been quite open. Uh, they had the tacit approval of the government. Nobody walked down the street with kippah then or shouting, we are Jews. But they got together and they did some prayers together and they had some social events together, you know, holiday parties and holidays uh, gathering. They did have starting 12, 13 years ago. It became more uh, formal seven years ago when the actual, what's called as the JCE, the Jewish Council of the Emirates was, uh, was uh, kind of established as a community uh, by two, three people. Uh, and, and slowly, slowly they collected more Jews and more Jews knew about it. They got together and they joined the, the community and uh, the community officially, as I said, um, was featured two years ago in the year of tolerance. And last year was registered right after the, the, the Abraham Accords. So, um, and the origin of the Jews really comes from A to Z, from Argentina to Zimbabwe, uh, the US, uh, United Kingdom, France, Morocco, Switzerland, uh, Italy, South uh, Africa, South America, Israel, of course, Turkey, uh, Greece, pretty much from everywhere Jews are here. There is no local indigenous Jews. Uh, you know, it's not like uh, going and living in Syria or in Egypt or in Tunisia or in Lebanon or in Morocco where those communities date back thousands of years, some of them. No, here, although uh, it is known that there were Jewish communities in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, uh, definitely before uh, the advent of Islam during and after. 
Um, there was a very well-known Jewish community in, in Medina. Uh, there was a well-known Jewish community in the Hejaz uh, region of Saudi Arabia. Uh, very well-known uh, Jewish uh, families uh, and, and, and tribes that live here. So that, that is well-known. I'm not exactly sure if in the area of the UAE, which is more on the uh, on the eastern part of the of the of the peninsula, if there were actually Jews, community Jewish communities or not. Most likely, this area was all desert except the coast. Uh, there is a emirate, part of the seven emirates that that make the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, called Ras Al Khema, which is the northern part, the pointy part closest to uh, to Iran, if we may say. <laughs> um, they found they found recently. Um, and I'm saying recently, maybe a year to two years ago, a uh, tombstone with Hebrew writings uh, that they have dated it five to 600 years maximum. Uh, so that shows at least a Jewish presence. They, all, they didn't find any other tombstones, only one. So could he have been a member of a Jewish community living there or he was just a traveler, a businessman who they used to travel by boats from from uh, Iraq all the way to India, passing by here, by the, by the Arabian Gulf. And maybe he stopped to sell his merchandise or he got sick and he stopped and he was buried here. Uh, so, but it is not known that there has, there has been a, a Jewish community in the United Arab Emirates. In the Arabian Peninsula and Saudi Arabia, definitely in Yemen, 2000 years, of course. In Oman, similarly to the UAE. Uh, in Bahrain, for example, there has there is a Jewish community that is 140 years old. That is the the oldest community that is still going, 140 years. It is made up of Persian and Iraqi Jews who uh, left Iran, you know, 100 and something years uh, when there was actually a persecution of the Jews in Iran. Then it's nothing new to Iran to persecute Jews. Um, but uh, there, there's a whole story of the Mashadi Jews that were forced to convert to Islam uh, in the 1860s, 1865. So, um, so some of those escaped to Bahrain and formed the Jewish community. What was that? There's a big group of them in Great Neck. Yes, of course, of course, of course, of course, yeah. And so, so the Bahraini community, as I said, is the oldest. One hundred and forty years. They have a synagogue. It's an old community made out of Iraqi and and Persian Jews. But in Qatar, uh, the, there isn't an indigenous Jewish community. Although there are Jews in Qatar, there are Jews in Oman. I just had a bat mitzvah in Oman last week. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Saudi Arabia. We know that they have, I would say, thousands of Jews there. A lot of uh, you know, if not businessmen, but professionals. Uh, that live there and work there. A few of them live as Jews. Um, Oman, as I said, likewise, Bahrain, Qatar, and, and, uh, and the UAE, the six GCC countries. So of course, Qatar is in the news quite a bit these days. Um, is there any chance that they, that they will stop funding Hamas and, and uh, become part of this nice, a uh, group of nations who are who are living kind of happily and trading with each other and sharing sharing all kinds of life. Experience. You know, we 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 hope so. We hope so. Uh, we hope so. But I think for Qatar to join the circle, there has to be more of a comprehensive uh, uh, agreement um, because Qatar is supportive of Hamas and. Although they say it's not that they're supportive of Hamas, but they're supportive of the humanitarian help of uh, to Gaza, and, and in fact, uh, some of those monies pass through Israel because Israel uh, agrees to to that support. So, um, but I, as I said, Qatar, I think it's going to be more when there is more of a comprehensive uh, peace in the region. But other countries, I believe, they will come before. And do you think that um, anybody is going to get in the way of um, U.S.? What about U.S. sanctions on Iran? I mean, what is the feeling in the in the rest of the region? Um, do they want them lifted? Do they want them to stay in place? I mean, they're a danger to a lot of other uh, countries.
countries in the region? Uh, the consensus that I hear here in, in the UAE and in the region, uh, they are not happy uh, with the Biden administration's uh, opening up to Iran and uh, recycling uh, the, the nuclear agreement. They were very happy with, uh, with President Trump's uh, administration policies and approach to, to uh, the issues of this region. That's, uh, that's what I get, that's what I, uh, what I hear, and that's what I understand. Uh, they are waiting with ang anxiety or anxiousness to see what is going to happen. Um, Sarah Lehman would like to know, do you think their support of Israel in the last two weeks has stemmed more from their opposition to Hamas as a puppet of Iran and out of love for Israel? Uh, no, I would not say that. I would not say so. I would say pretty much is equal. They understand Hamas is a terrorist organization and they have said so. They understand that and they consider Hamas to be a part of the, uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, which uh, this region is completely against. And they're trying to prevent uh, them to infiltrate any of those Arab countries. So, uh, so, uh, so they believe that. And they also believe that Hamas receives money from Iran and Hamas uh, represent um, uh, false Islam or radical extreme Islam, which they're not in accord here. Uh, but they also- would they, feel was the that? would they feel the same way about Hezbollah? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, they feel the same way about Hezbollah, but they also feel that Israel has the right to defend itself that the Jews have the right to the land of Israel. Uh, and so I, I wouldn't say uh, more because of that they, they hate Hamas that they love Israel. I, I, I think it's a very well-balanced uh, attitude and approach. Um, so with such good relations uh, between Jews and Arabs in the UAE, it sounds almost idyllic. Um, how do we get this truth across to everybody that, that Jews and Arabs can live together very peacefully? Well, I guess uh, the more we speak about it, the more we write about it, the more people come and visit here and see it with their own eyes, I think the more people uh, will hear about it. Uh, there have been uh, MOU signed between the UAE and Israel almost in every single a uh, human endeavor in science and technology, in medicine and agriculture, in security, in cybersecurity, in medicine, everything, uh, education and tourism. Uh, it, it, is a, it is an accord uh, that is really uh, bearing its fruits. Um, next week, we have the Jerusalem Post Conference in Dubai. You're kidding. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. June 1st to June 3rd. If you want to join, please come, come in. Uh, yes, and, uh, and it's going to be, uh, there's going to be Israeli politicians, Israeli businessmen, Emirati politicians, Emirati businessmen, all participating in one hall with one, uh, you know, uh, conference. That's a yes. giant step. Giant step. Um, are you recognized as the official representative of Judaism? Um, and how, as an Orthodox rabbi, do you represent those Jews who practice conservative or reform um, or other rituals? Right. So, so uh, yes, I am recognized by the government as the, the representative of the Jewish community. And as a Jewish community, we are kind of an umbrella community where Jews can practice their brand of Judaism, so to speak. Uh, so far, we are very small in numbers to have different uh, denominations or practicing denominations. But in our group, we have Ashkenazim, we have Sephardim, we have Orthodox, we have Conservative, we have Egalitarians. But our services are traditional, traditional services, uh, which uh, in many countries are conducted, even though the members of the community may espouse different uh, level of observance. Uh, observancy, you know, of, of keeping the, the laws, the Torah, and, and things like that. But uh, when it comes to, to official um, uh, prayers, and it, it's all done traditionally. So that way, everybody can participate. Right. That, that seems to be the way that um, 
services are conducted in, in the United States, um, traditional, and everybody sort of goes to within the Sephardic world. Yeah, within the Sephardic world, yes. So I, you know, I, I joke here with some of the members of the Jewish community. I say, you know, this is an Arab country, and therefore we have to follow the Sephardic traditional uh, prayers. So, so that way, because you know, as you know, Sephardic Jews never, excuse me, never divided into different denominations. Right. Services are traditional, uh, milestones are traditional, and people in their private home and private life, you know, they, they do whatever uh, they feel comfortable with. But when it comes to synagogue and official milestones, they, they follow tradition. So that's what we are here. So where do you see it going from here? Where? Well, uh, I see strengthening uh, the Jewish community. I am sure uh, and I believe that the Jewish community will be growing. Uh, from four type of, uh, of population, Jewish population. So first we're going to have the regular tourists who might come for a week or two weeks, uh, either, you know, American Jews, Israeli Jews, uh, European Jews, South American Jews, they'll come for curiosity, for exotic uh, place, so they'll come. So those will be here for a week to two weeks at a time. And as such, we need to provide them kosher food, prayer services if they look for that, so on and so forth. The second type of population are those Jews who come to do some business here. And they might come for more than two weeks. They might stay two, three weeks and come several times a year to, to do business here as, as um, business is really very good in all areas, uh, in all areas of, of uh, commerce. And so those people will also stay here at a longer period of time. Uh, so we also have to uh, consider them and, and serve them as, as needs with kosher food, with, with synagogues, with holidays, and so on and so forth. The third type of population are going to be those same businessmen who decide to make a residency here, but they will still uh, go back and forth to their country of origin. Uh, that's because uh, there's no income tax and there's no... Um, there's no corporate tax. There's no corporate tax either. So, so it's a good for them to reside here, even though they might go you know, back to their country of origin for many months, but at least they'll stay here for the required months for residency. And they will establish a business here. They will open up businesses and, and offices. And of course, those that will become part of the Jewish community. And then lastly, uh, the fourth type of population will be those who are, if not escaping, but leaving behind anti-Semitism, like the Jews in Europe, uh, France. And Jews in America. Yeah, that's my next one. And Jews in, in the United States, exactly. And many of those, they will find a safe haven here. Again, the weather is beautiful. Um, the, the country is beautiful. Uh, they're gonna feel very safe and welcome. And they're going to do business. They're going to make a good living here, if, you know. And so these the four type of population that I believe that within the next three to five years we might end up with like five thousand Jews, and maybe in ten years we'll end up with ten thousand Jews. I guess depending also on the situation in the U.S. and Europe. But what I have been seeing in the last week in New York, Los Angeles, Miami, and other areas of the United States attack on Jews in, in Borough Park itself, in Brooklyn, and Manhattan. As, uh, as astonishing. Uh, I tell you, uh, I walk here, as I said, with my kippah on my head. I don't even look back. I don't even worry about anything. In New York, I would have to. In fact, in New York, I was almost assaulted last year during Corona when walking down the street on 2nd Avenue and 66, 67th Street. One of those hoodlums, he says, uh, you brought the disease, you Jews are the sick ones, you brought the disease here. This was in New York in the middle of the day. Uh, and so I think many of those Jews might find uh, the UAE as a place to relocate if they're not choosing Israel for that. Um, are, you, are you spending time uh, go learning each other's narrative? In other words, from, from the point of view of Zionist Jews, um, we, we have 
uh, a narrative going back 3,500 years, and it's not just uh, historical, but it's a legal uh, right to be in Israel. And I mean, do you spend time trying to, to, and I'm sure the UAE has a similar narrative that I don't know. Um, do you spend time trying to understand each other's history? Well, uh, as I said, uh, many of them, they want to know more about Jews and Judaism. They want to know about uh, really? history of Jews. Yes, religious, no, but also history, okay. history. And, and many of them have, uh, have confided in me uh, by telling me, it's, we are so sorry that for 73 years, we were told of a wrong narrative of lies, of a made up history. Uh, and we are so thankful that finally we are able to open up our eyes and see the real narratives. We feel that we that our history and our uh, our relationship has been hijacked by the Palestinians, and uh, and we are so happy that we have freed ourselves from that and finally seen the true narrative and the true history. Uh, that, that's what I have been told by many people here. So uh, do you think that the group in the Abraham Accords will have an ability to uh, influence people in Israel who, or even people in the States or people outside of their, their immediate uh, yeah. circle to right. understand the Israeli narrative because right. here, we're just hearing occupiers, and uh, it, it's 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 very disturbing. Yeah, uh, you don't hear that uh, that word in this region. Uh, definitely not by government official, and not by society. There might be some in, in social media that they, they still use that word, but you don't hear it in the street. Um, you know, m many many, as I said. Uh, have uh, have seen what Israel has gone through because of terrorism, and uh, many have said that that they are really happy that uh, that they can finally see see the you know the true narratives. You know the the many of these countries in in the region, uh, especially those that signed the Abraham Accord, have already changed their school books uh, as how they teach about Israel, the region, and Judaism. Morocco has done it. The UAE has done it from the moment that they signed the, and even maybe before they signed the Abraham Accords, Morocco has done it. Even Egypt has done it. Uh, and Bahrain also. So, uh, so they, they have taken, they have taken action to change that narrative. And in fact, um, they have stopped supporting madrasas and schools that outside the region in the US, or in the or in the PA territories that they have, they have stopped supporting even UNRWA uh, with the, you know any of those schools that they still maintain the old narrative in their school books. So that's that's a change. You know, you've effectuated so much um, wonderful, so many wonderful things um, that I that I hesitate to, to move to a different kind of topic. Um, you know, we, we are so appreciative of all the work you're doing, um, but I bet some of us are a little bit curious about how your family reacted to this move and just a little bit on the personal side. Uh, well, my wife is here with me and she has been here since Passover. Uh, the first four months I came by myself to uh, prepare the, the territory, so to speak, and then so she came for Passover and she stayed. Uh, my rest of the kids, they came to visit uh, for Passover also, but um, my youngest is 21. Uh, they are all married except that last one. So uh, they all have their life in New York, their families in New York. They were very excited for me because they knew it is something that, uh, that I like to do. It's something that I have been involved for many years. So they saw it as a, uh, if not a culmination, but, but the realization of my uh, decades of, of, of work on behalf of the Jewish community and, and the Jews. Um, and is there like a, a, a social society for, for um, it doesn't have to necessarily be just Jews. Like how, how is it socializing? In, in 
uh... It's, uh, there is a organization called Sharaka. Sharaka is a social organization composed by Emiratis and Israelis. Uh, we socialized together. We had a Lagla Omer celebration combined with an iftar during Ramadan. Uh, there was a beautiful video circulating in social media. If you want to look for it, it's called Sharaka, S-H-A-R-A-K-A, -A -A, Sharaka. Uh, beautiful organization of Emiratis and Israelis. There is also the, the UAE Israel Business Council. There's the Abrahamic, uh, uh, Abrahamic Business Circle. There have been a lot of uh, organizations that combine Israelis and Emiratis and a lot of, of events. I'm invited at least once or twice a week to attend those events uh, as, the, as the rabbi of, of the country, of the community. And so, uh, yes, there's a lot of, of, of that. There's a lot of that. Yeah, great. And the other thing I'm curious, is there as much business, is it equal, like uh, Emiratis going to Israel and Israelis coming to, to the UAE? Is it kind of equal in terms of uh, are, are the Emiratis? They are, well, uh, uh, yeah, yeah of course, they are. And let me tell you that in December, January, we had over 100,000 Israelis here. Wow. And and none of them, not all of them were Jews. Uh, we had a Druze business delegation. We had a Muslim business delegation. Uh, uh, we had a Bedouin business delegation here, all Israelis from different, uh, different religion. And they are all thrilled, really thrilled that, uh, that this, these accords took place because now they feel they could, they could do commerce and business with, 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 with the UAE. And that's what they were looking for. And there have been many Emiratis that that uh, that travel to Israel also for investment and uh, meeting uh, uh, socially and academically. Uh, they have been, of course, with the Corona, it was limited. But now that the doors are opening up, you're going to start seeing many of those delegations. We, there's, I don't know how many, or maybe over a hundred delegation expected right after uh, Sukkot, uh, planning to come here. Jewish delegations. Are there any Jewish hotels, or do you have to supply food elsewhere? Well, there are there are there are uh, three hotels with kosher restaurants and very good hotels. One of them is the Armani, who is in the Burj Khalifa. There is a kosher restaurant. The other one is the Grand Hyatt with a kosher restaurant there, and the other one is the Address Marina, also a very good hotel uh, with a kosher restaurant. Plus, there are two kosher caterers. Uh, a bagel store is opening up soon, um, uh, and soon we will have a, a, a bakery also, a kosher bakery, and eventually we will have kosher shechita done here in the slaughterhouses of Dubai. I visited them private, you know, personally, and we're trying to put everything into, into place. Well, it sounds like you are just doing the greatest service for Israel and uh, and the region, and uh, we thank you. We just thank you, and thank you for coming to speak to us and let us know. I mean, it's been so eye-opening uh, for me, and for, I hope for the rest of, of the audience. Thank you. So, I, I don't know if you've seen some of those questions in the chat. Uh, oh, I was looking at the chat, and I think I saw, I thought I saw all of them. So let, let me maybe go over some of those questions quickly. Uh, uh, any chance of opening up a publishing company that translates Jewish religious texts into Arabic? Absolutely. If you want to do that, please come. I'm sure many of the Emiratis will, will appreciate the Sidurim in Arabic or Humashim in Arabic or any Jewish literature in Arabic. Uh, how many Jews live in the UAE? There are over a thousand Jews that live here, but only like 200 to 250 are active in the, in the community. The rest, hopefully, eventually, they will become active. Uh, we will eventually have a school. So far, we have, I would say, only 30 children at different ages. But once uh, we establish the community, we will open up a school. We will build up also a mikveh and, of course, a bedin and a kashrut authority, which I already have, uh, have incorporated. Uh, so we have a few Jews that, that can form the congregation. Um, 
uh, yeah, we spoke about Iran, uh, UA support for Israel. We already spoke about that. Um, uh, we did that. Here, is there a difference between um, the royal family and the rest of the population? Well, uh, the, 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 the Emirati population is very, very respectful of the government and of the royal family. They adore them. It's a very benevolent uh, monarchy. And so uh, they go along with whatever the decision uh, the royal family does or the government makes. And those decisions are usually by consensus. They're by consensus. They're, they're not edict. They're by consensus, which is, which is, uh, which is good. Uh, there are no radical imams in the UAE. There are no radical imams in the UAE. Any radical imam who speaks uh, improperly will be removed. That I could uh, guarantee you. Uh, now, there were no Jews really that left or expelled from the UAE because there was not a Jewish community. Unlike the other 10 Jewish, 10, excuse me, Arab countries like Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Yemen, and Aden, uh, where there were Jews and they were either expelled or persecuted because of 1948 establishment of Israel. But there wasn't any Jew here uh, or any Jewish community either here or Saudi Arabia during, the, during that time. So no Jew was expelled or went to Israel. Um, okay, we spoke about that. Uh, would a delegation including FCB be welcome? Very, very welcome. Please come at any time, Judy. Bring your 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 uh, your FC uh, community. We'll be more than uh, happy and and uh, and honored to to welcome you. Wonderful. Um, okay. What else? I thought I was well, going down the line. Yeah, a diplomatic role for young Mizrahi rabbis. If so, how would we train them for this role? Yeah, I do see, but I think the community is too small yet to to handle more than uh, one or two rabbis. So, but eventually, if the community grows, then there will certainly be a role for Mizrahi rabbis to participate. Um, yeah, Hamas, I think it's, uh, it's outlawed here in the UAE with other terror organization. Uh, Saudi Arabia is negotiating with Iran. I don't know the, 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 the ins and out of that, but um, I doubt it. I doubt it. I think that's just a, uh, uh, maybe an American uh, rumor. Um, contact with Kuwait. I have contact with some Jews in Kuwait that are part of the Association of Gulf Jewish Communities that I formed a few months ago to service those Jews that live in those areas also. So we do have contact with some Jews in Kuwait. That's correct. Um, Rebecca has a good question here. Yes. Sorry. Are you seeing it? Here in the New York City and over much of the United States, we're experiencing alarming incidents of anti-Semitism, which was what triggered, which was triggered by the false narrative of Israel being an apartheid state and that Jews are responsible for killing innocent Palestinians, um, especially children, during the recent war. How can the UAE's relationship with their Jewish population serve as a model of peace and tolerance between Muslims and Jews here in America? Well, you see, the, the, the problem, you know, uh, I, I was attending a, uh, a meeting with the ambassador of the UAE uh, several months ago, and he was asked uh, by American Jews, uh, how do you deal with extremist element uh, in Islam or Muslims? And his answer was, we don't have that problem in the UAE. That problem is strictly in the US and Europe. Uh, and, and so I would say the same thing. We don't have that problem in the UAE. Uh, that problem, unfortunately, is in the West, in the Europe and the USA for allowing extremist uh, uh, imams or extremist uh, Muslims or Islam uh, believers to, to uh, basically uh, roam free, say whatever they want, incite violence, incite hatred, and the West doesn't do anything about it. And that's a problem. But here we don't have that problem. Um, there's no such uh, imams, there's no such uh, hateful speeches, there's no such uh, incitement to violence. Uh, there's no such thing here. And that's why uh, there is tolerance, coexistence, harmon harmonious living amongst all the, the population. 
but that's a that's a challenge that the U.S. and the West Europe uh, need to need to face because uh, unless uh, they uh, try to resolve it, it's just getting bigger and bigger. Mindy Stein asks, um, how can the UAE help the international community understand that they should stop funding UNRWA until the educational textbooks are changed? Well, they have, like I said before, they did have, and they are encouraging their, their partners to stop funding uh, schools and madrasas that they have uh, hateful uh, teaching against the Jews, against peace, or against any other religion, against any other religion. They believe that, that, uh, radical, that radicals have hijacked Islam. So uh, is there an attempt by the, by the UAE to um, export that understanding that, that, um, that the radicals have been uh, doing, you know, they, yeah. they've well, been- uh, By they've example, been that there is. Things. And of course, of course, there is an attempt. They have spoken about it. A, an article was written yesterday by Dr. Ali Rashid Al Nuaimi, who is a friend of mine. He holds a very high position in the defense uh, uh, department of, of the UA of the United Arab Emirates, and he wrote a beautiful article. Actually, I think it was published in uh, maybe in the Times of Israel. Let me just take a look in a second. I'll let you know. If you can read it, you'll see basically what is the official position uh, of the UAE when it comes to that. It was published actually in Ynet, believe it or not. Oh. It was published in Ynet. It's, it's called, Hebrew. yes. It's called US policy must reflect changes in the new Middle East. That's the article. Uh, so yes, the UAE has been trying to, if not export, but teach by example, uh, by writing, by, by policy, and by stopping the support of radical Islam. Okay, well, did we have any more questions that we missed? There may be um, some more questions. I just don't know how much time um, Rabbi Abadi has uh, because... Um, we're, we're, we're over time now, and I don't know what the schedule was. I have time. After this, I'm going to sleep. So, <laughs> so, For, so to me, it's after 11 p.m., so uh, don't worry. Okay, so there, there were questions about funding for you. There were questions about how careful you need to be in, in terms of uh, what you say, since they don't allow anything that, that is considered radical, is there a line that you have to be careful about? Um, and then there were questions about the Abraham Accords and, um, and uh, should Biden give the PA more power? Uh, in my, my language, it's, he is giving them veto power over the regional stability. Um, will the Abraham Accords survive that regardless of what the United States does? The Abraham Accord will survive that, have survived these 11 days uh, without much of, a, uh, of, of, of anything. Uh, I do believe that the Abraham Accord will survive because uh, those accords were between people, not just between governments, unlike the accords with Egypt and Jordan and Israel. Uh, but these accords are with society, with the community, with the people, people to people, government to government. It has survived and it will continue to survive. In fact, it probably will survive even better uh, given uh, the um, instability of, uh, of, uh, of the policies of the Biden administration in regards to the Middle East. I think we've we've been we've been through um, almost the whole list, and I wanted to thank you very much. This has been incredibly enlightening. Um, feeling yeah. fe feeling like you can you can be there yeah. and be Jewish is probably um, more secure than most Jews are here in New York. I, I see a question by my dear friend Ken Abramowitz. 
Uh, is there any local pressure on you to better fit in your local society by taking on three more wives? Uh, <laughs> Ken, if you want to come here and, and I'll facilitate that for you with pleasure. <laughs> Nira, please don't don't hate me for that comment. But um, no, there's no pressure. There's no pressure. In fact, the new generation are no longer marrying more than one wife. The older generation, yes, but the new generation, not anymore. Of course, there might be a few here and there, but... Um, it's still legal. But, uh, but it's legal. It's legal. Yeah, of course it's legal. Uh, you know, I, I could make a whole comment about monogamy. Uh, but may not be part of this uh, of this uh, of this talk. But uh, uh, you know, monogamy in the West, uh, I have to say, uh, is mostly a uh, a fake imposed policy because uh, we know that the, the rate of uh, of divorce and the rate of uh, of infidelity throughout the West is uh, huge. In fact, in Europe. Uh, to have a, a, a not, they don't call it second wife, but to have a friend is very well accepted amongst presidents, amongst ministers in France and Italy, um, you know, in all those countries. So here it's legal. Uh, in the West, it's, uh, it's under the table. Let me put it that way. Okay, so that also was very enlightening. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, again, I, I, we can't thank you enough, and uh, please keep us updated as, as things change. We hope to have you back again, and um, uh, it's, it's just been a wonderful hour spent with you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Wishing you a refuah and uh, and uh, you know Yashi uh, Koyach for leading this organization, um, uh, and uh, I'm sure you're doing uh, your mom very very proud of of, of what you're doing. Uh, I'll always remember her very very fondly. May God bless her soul. Continue doing uh, the good work that you do, Judy, and all of you. Uh, and uh, we we have to be for our people because. If not us, then who? Right. Absolutely. Oh, and Kenny, my brother Kenny is on also. And he's also Yes, okay, yes, of course. Thanks to thank thank Kenny. Thank you too too. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Of course. Okay. So, so uh, you're please so you're more than welcome to come and visit us over here. I'll be more than happy to welcome you. We're really looking forward to it. Yeah. Really, as soon as things open up. Very well. Okay. So take care now. Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And Bye -bye. we'll see you again soon. Bye. Bye.